I'm Michelle Malek and you're watching Indus Special. One in four people in the world are affected by mental disorders. This figure by the World Health Organization gives us a glimpse into, into how common mental illnesses are. To move forward, it's important to become aware of the many ways in which people face challenges to their health and how deep the impact can be. On today's show, we will be talking about one specific mental health challenge, bipolar disorder. How can we understand the nature of this disease in order to co correctly identify it? How can we help those suffering from it to cope better? Let's discuss this further with our guests. Joining us is Dr. Finza Latif, who's a child psychiatrist at Sidra Medicine, joining us from Qatar. Also joining us today is Tuba Fatma, who's a therapist who works with trauma, depression, and anxiety, especially in young people. Uh, she joins us from Lahore. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Tuba, I'd like to begin with you. Now, many experts are coming out and saying that mental health across the world is worsening as the years are going by. But then many experts are going one step further and saying it's not just that it's worsening. We're in the middle of a mental health crisis. Do you agree with that? Um, health, family, financial stressors, and um, when all of these things combine, our mental health tends to suffer more. Um, so there, there certainly is an, an ongoing um, um, sort of high-intensity uh, mental health um, un unfolding sort of um, crisis. So I, I, I do agree. I think in, in this particular year, given uh, you know the, the nature of everything that's that's happening around us. Um, combined with just, I think the the, the stressful lives that um, that all of us um, have been living for a while, um, combined with I think everyone um, everything that's going on just um, and and environmentally, the, the the planet has been um, has been suffering. Right. Um, so yes, I'm I'm afraid I would have to agree. Right. I specifically begin with this qu question to so we can all understand and appreciate what we're dealing with something that acknowledges the fact that people are suffering and this is a conversation that is needed to have. Many people are saying that once this pandemic is over, we're going to be seeing a surge in many crises which deal with mental health. And therefore, it's important to talk about various disorders and various ways that people already who have underlying mental health uh, conditions, how they're going to be aggravated in the coming days and how they can deal with it. Uh, given that, Dr. Latif, uh, I want to talk a little about this bipolar disorder and especially how it progresses, how it develops some of the risk factors, especially when we're dealing with children. Right. So bipolar disorder, um, it's actually one of the most misunderstood psychiatric illnesses. And so I'm so glad you're having this um, program to talk more about it. Um, why it develops, it, there are multi, multiple factors. Genetics play a big role. So we've seen that if one parent has bipolar disorder, the child may be 10 times more likely than others to actually experience that. Um, and then how it presents is it's, um, the, that's where the common misunderstandings come from. People often think if someone's being moody or going from one mood to another in a few hours, they have bipolar disorder, but that's actually not true. It's a very debilitating illness um, with episodes of severe depression, episodes of severe mania. Right. You're talking about how debilitating it is, how it's misunderstood. Many people conflate it uh, with normal mood swings. But can we uh, delve a little deeper into it and the types of uh, bipolar uh, disorder categories there are? Is there a scale on which it becomes more severe? Uh, and are there cases in which it might be mild and might even go undetected? Right. That's a really, really great question. So certainly um, there, there are two types of bipolar disorder and, and they really differ in their severity. The most severe form is called bipolar disorder type one. Um, and then the less severe form is called bipolar disorder type two. Mind you, what really determines severity is what impact it's have, having on your functioning. So a lot of patients with both bipolar disorder type one and type two have uh, difficulty with interpersonal relationships. They can't hold a job. For children, it can be very difficult. Um, in, in school, it leads to academic decline. 
So specifically speaking, bipolar disorder type 1, which is the most severe type, um, is characterized by a manic episode, which basically in layman's terms means you have... Um, Ex your mood is not um, stable, so it is, you are either excessively happy or extremely irritable, which causes a lot of difficulty, and it comes along with in not needing to sleep, excessive energy. And then the most problematic thing is, is the changes in your thinking. So a lot of times, patients who, have, who are in the middle of a manic episode cannot think rationally. So they often have very irrational thoughts, um, and it can, again, range from just believing you have excessive powers when you don't to the other extreme where you might actually have a delusion or uh, become psychotic, like hearing voices or believing things that are not true. Right. Uh, stay with that point, uh, Dr. Latif. I want to talk more about how people can understand when a person is suffering from these episodes. And really recognize that they are suffering from uh, uh, an episode caused by bipolar disorder. But I want to quickly jump to Tuba and talk to her a little more about the risk factors we were talking about earlier. Tuba, how can experiences, especially related to trauma, cause disorders to develop later on in life? Is that common or is that usually a, an unusual occurrence? Trauma, you know, sort of just as as it implies, is um, something that's that's really overwhelming for for any person to experience um, physically uh, as well as you know for for your mental health. Um, so it is very common for some form or the other of mental health issues to um, stem from you know from having these sorts of experiences. Um, in, in terms of bipolar disorder specifically, right. um, sometimes, you know, what, what can happen is that um, someone can have a tendency to develop a, a, a certain mental illness and um, environmental stressors can sort of ex exacerbate things to an extent where the illness will then sort of, you know, um, just sort of uh, come, come up. Um, in if if I go back to you know uh, the, the the question you asked about like the connection between trauma and and mental health and mental illness, um, to me it's 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 sort of like saying well if you get hit by a car are are you going to be hurt? Is right. it going to change the way you walk? Is it going to change the way you look at the world? Of course it is. Um, trauma is is very likely to cause changes in mood. It's very likely to change you know the way that the relationship that we have with ourselves and that we have with other people. Um, for for bipolar in particular, while it can be related to a, a, a history of trauma, um, from I, I would say that it's much more likely that um, stressful or traumatic circumstances might um, e exacerbate or raise the chances of um, of um, having it or or it showing up. Um, you know, as as we just heard, um, sometimes these things can sort of like run in 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 um, the family, mm. um, and so it it really isn't that you know something happened or or the person did or did not do something, um, as you know, like any or or like some physical illnesses, um, some m mental health um, illnesses will also just show up because we unfortunately just, that's how our um, gene code is, is written. Right, Dr. Latif, talking about that a more, uh, that it is more likely that a person might have bipolar disorder uh, relative to someone who doesn't have it running in their family. They, if their parents, if someone in their family does, they might inherit that gene. If we're trying to unpack that a little more and understand how families, if not preempt, but can, bring in some form of early intervention when they do have cases of bipolar disorder within their families, what are some of the things you find are important to do in that situation? Before we go to interventions, I just wanted to say a little bit more about what Duva mentioned uh, related to risk factors. Um, you know, definitely trauma can impact uh, your mood and your functioning, but for bipolar disorder specifically, it's actually very help uh, important to remember it is, it is a biological illness. So if you look at a, a brain of a, a person who has bipolar disorder versus one that doesn't, we will find, and we have found, changes in, in how the brain cells connect and in the function of the brain, um, in the chemicals 
things that are released. So in a way, so that is your risk factor. And then in addition, if there are environmental changes, that can impact. There's also a field of study called epigenetics, which actually looks at how your environment impacts your genes. So certain genes, including genes for bipolar disorder, may remain dormant um, right. in some individuals versus others where the environment actually activates the gene. So if you, you know, have an environmental change, family relationships, trauma, then that gene is much more likely to express itself. Dr. Lateef, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry to interject here, but uh, just want to expand on that a little, because both you and Tuba did mention environmental factors that might exacerbate dormant uh, genes here. Could you just give us a couple of examples so we are more familiar to how that happens? An example, uh, uh, you know, that, that is very commonly used is presence of trauma. So uh, physical or um, other emotional trauma as a child um, can activate genes for depression. Uh, so that's an example. Um, so, so, so it's, it's um, you know, you can't, you, it's also hard to pinpoint this is exactly what caused the bipolar disorder to right. appear because it is multifactorial, like I said. Right. Now, going back to uh, the early question about early intervention, is that possible in this case? And if it is, what are some of the ways that parents or family members can recognize that a child might have a uh, that gene might be predisposed to something like the bipolar disorder? So first of all, if you, if you have a family history of bipolar disorder, an aunt, an uncle, a, a first cousin, then you are more likely so that should, to develop it. So that should always be in the background. Secondly, absolutely early detection um, it can be done in children. A lot of times there can be years of what we call uh, pre-morbid symptoms, i.e. that is before you actually develop bipolar disorder, the manic and depressive episodes. Prior to that, you have um, milder symptoms, like more. these are kids who are more irritable or much more anxious mm. or may have more angry outbursts early on in life. And then later on in life, um, they actually develop the full-fledged manic and depressive episodes. So, so as a child psychiatrist, we often treat those children early on for anxiety, depression with parent training and um, how to respond to them, providing special supports at school so that their functional decline is, doesn't you know, start early. Right. In this case, uh, I'm going to put this question in terms of young adults to Tuba as well, but just putting this to you, how can parents recognize, other than the fact that they need to be on the lookout for a family member that might already have bipolar disorder, if their child is exhibiting certain signs, how can they differentiate between that being normal and uh, that being something a little more serious in which they need to seek out professional help? Right. It, it, this is this is a difficult question. It sometimes can be very difficult to different, differentiate between behavior as a response to your environment. Um, I, if the child is having angry outbursts because they have their, their family relationships are impaired, versus if they're having irritability or angry outbursts because these are premorbid symptoms of bipolar disorder. One of the ways to determine, or for parents to decide whether the child needs treatment or needs to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, is if there is functional decline. If because of these issues they're not able to make or keep friends, or they're not able to complete their classwork, or they're having major outbursts in, at school and getting you know, sent out of school. Right. Um, at the same time in the home, if everybody around them feels like they need to walk on eggshells or, they're, they're, they'll, or otherwise they'll just explode, those things are, are not normal behavior um, right. in children. Right. Tuba, that same question, and when we're talking about young adults, not children who might find it difficult to express themselves in many ways, but young adults, when should parents realize what they're saying uh, is serious? They need to take it more seriously. We know that cultural factors play uh, a determinant, play a factor in how seriously mental illnesses are taken within a family. What should be a red flag for families that now they need to actually take what the child is saying seriously? 
Um, well, well, I think a, a combination of factors, and you know, like it was mentioned, it is it it can be very difficult to exactly pinpoint um, or, or exactly see what is happening. But um, I would say again, like starting from just just being aware if if there's a family history um, of this um, this this this. Um, specific um, condition I, I I also it's it's important to note that um, for a lot of serious mental illnesses um, young adulthood so that age between like let's say 25 to 35 mm -hmm. um, is the average age of when sort of like these high intensity symptoms may start to emerge um, so just keeping an eye out for that I, I think, um, again, like functions being effective. So it's one thing to, you know, feel bad and maybe um, not go as often to, to like school or class or work. But if someone is unable, to, you know, consistently unable to go to school, consistently unable to hold a job um, and is uh, and, and their um, functioning is impaired, um, then I think it's it's a good time to to seek help. Um, right. with, with young adults in, especially, um, I, I encourage the adults around them. Um, I, I, I find that lots of, lots of children and young adults are when, when they're not doing well, they're asked the question, what's wrong with you? Um, and I would reframe that question to what is holding you back? Right. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really helpful to, is, you know, to, to drop that assumption that you're your child just wants wants to be a troublesome child. Um, in my three years of work so far, I've never met a child who wants to be a bad child or wants to be a child who's not doing well. Right. Um, so just if, if, if you're noticing something off, just sitting down, you know, with your kid and asking them like, hey, what's going on? And really listening to them um, might help you understand, you know, how they feel, what they're able to or not able to um, kind of uh, con control for, for themselves. Right. Um, with with bipolar in particular, I, I do stress the importance of seeking good professional help. Um, this is this is definitely not something that can just kind of be fixed, you know, um, by um, the you, your family, your friends. There there is a real need for um, like professional assistance, well trained like psychological this. intervention, right. um, and sometimes um, you know seeking as as psychiatric opinion is is also a good idea right thank you so much uh Tuba fatma for joining us and giving us more insight into this uh dr latif now we're talking about this and i do want to understand it better for myself and also for those who are watching this when we say that these individuals some of the symptoms in which we can recognize that they're suffering from bipolar disorder is that they're not able to hold normal re relations aren't able to hold jobs Given that this might be one of the patterns or might be some of the behavioral symptoms of bipolar disorder, is this inevitable that this is what is going to uh, uh, turn out in that situation? This is how life is going to be for them. You know, absolutely not. It's important to remember bipolar disorder is a treatable illness. Um, just like diabetes and hypertension, it is a chronic illness. So if you have it, you will have to live with it for the rest of your life. But treatments are available that can prevent you from having the manic and depressive episodes that impact your job and your family um, and and make you making you capable of, uh, of having a, a healthy and successful life. Um, that's not to say that these individuals don't have challenges, even when treated. They they struggle with significant challenges, and, and they're for often people who have family support, whose families are engaged and not blaming them, but right. are actually supporting them emotionally, do much better. Um, one of the risks, one of the major risks of having untreated bipolar disorder is um, is actually suicide. There's a 10 to 15 percent of patients with bipolar disorder uh, complete suicide. So those are those, those are staggering numbers, and and the risk factors for those include um, not having supports um, around you. 
Right. Uh, that's important to remember that it's essential to first recognize what the individual is dealing with and then help them get the professional help they need in order to prevent a serious outcome, a grave consequence of what they're dealing with. As uh, Dr. Latif mentioned, in many cases, uh, suicide becomes a result of not being able to properly treat something that is as serious as the bipolar disorder. Now joining us is David J. Milwaukwitz, who is a professor of psychiatry in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of California, Los Angeles. He joins us from Los Angeles. Thank you so much, David, for joining us and welcome to the show. Now, we've been trying to understand a little more about how we can identify those who are suffering from bipolar disorder and what those around them, especially family members, can do. Now, hearing about these episodes and when individuals are suffering from it, of course, it takes a toll on them naturally, but also the people around them. How can uh, community support and family support help them better deal uh, with an episode? Okay, for, so first, when we talk about episodes of bipolar disorder, uh, we're talking about both manias and depressions. So people going up and becoming extremely agitated, uh, thinking they're on top of the world, thinking that they uh, have special powers, not sleeping at all, maybe sleeping only a few hours a night, feeling full of energy, um, and then crashing down to the state of depression where they feel like they can't get out of bed, have no energy, uh, suicide starts to open to uh, uh, occur in their mind as an option, uh, their move, thoughts move very slowly, they have very low motivation, fatigue, uh, and a deep sense of sadness. And in bipolar disorder, we see these rapid, uh, sometimes rapid transitions between these high and low states. The effect on family members uh, is very difficult because family members probably haven't seen this before. And they don't really know how to recognize the early warning signs of, right. uh, of a manic or a depressive episode. So they have to be on the lookout for changes in the person's behavior when this episode is happening, as you say, that many families don't know how to deal with it, they don't know how to recognize it. But given that they do have the background information, they do know that this individual does uh, suffer from bipolar disorder, what can they do during that episode uh, to prevent that person becoming uh, a potential uh, a threat to themselves and to the people around them? Well, the first thing, thing is families need to learn what we call the early warning signs of an episode. So there's a buildup to a manic or depressive episode. For example, a person may stop sleeping or they may sleep very little. Very commonly you hear things like, uh, I don't need to sleep. I can be more productive by staying up later. They start to talk very fast, get very grandiose, full of ideas. And the, the difficulty for families is some, first, the person may become aggressive uh, and angry and kind of irritable and snap at them for no apparent reason. They may be uh, caught up in their projects, start uh, pulling away from the family. The family moves too slow for them. They feel uh, this is a time for me to be productive and really create things. Uh, the families have to, uh, catch those episodes early, see the early warning signs, because that's when the person's most likely to respond to medications. And this is a disorder where you need medications in order to uh, fully benefit or to be able to stabilize. And likewise, during depressions, I see the images you have there of people who are very withdrawn, sad, uh, unhappy, uh, maybe suicidal, and the, the role of the family there is first to be encouraging and supportive to the person right. uh, and to help them have a structure to their day, to be uh, um, encouraging to um, help them uh, get out of bed in the morning, uh, try to get some exercise if they can, um, again, take their medications if they haven't taken medications. Uh, there, there are various things they can do to keep the person activated. Hopefully things that the person enjoys or can uh, look forward to getting up and doing during the day. So the key for families, I think, is really being able to know early these are the signs that the person is starting to 
go up or go down. Right. Uh, and if they're going up, we need in both cases we need to make sure they're on medications. Um, in uh, in the case of uh, them going down, we really have to make sure the family is supportive and knows the importance of structure and support. Right. Uh, Dr. Latif, just uh, want to quickly see you. Now, as uh, David tells us about the various ways in which families can offer support to those individuals who are uh, going through an episode and what they can do, the various activities, how they can help them structure their day. Something that Tuba mentioned stayed with me in this regard was uh, about the language that is used in order to communicate with them. How essential is that being careful with the words you use and the sentences you use, the phrases you use? Right. Uh, that is so important. So so I, I do think, you know, two of the most important things that, that a family member can do for someone suffering from bipolar disorder is, one, offer empathy, which is the ability to really understand what the person is going through, and to be able to validate with their words. Even if it's something simple, I understand that um, you're feeling sad today, and just connecting with them and and then asking them, what is it that I can do to help you get through this? Um, it's very important to not blame each other. It's, a, it's a, again, that's why I stress the biological nature of this illness. Mm. This is not a behavior that's under the person's control. And if families can remember that, it's much, e much easier for them to feel empathy for, for, for the person that they're caring for. Right. And just simple, concrete things that that um, families can do is, is is a small thing like reminding them to take their medication because because often this illness comes with lack of real insight into what 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 uh, is going on right uh, David now uh, we talk a lot on the show about social media about various things that cause a gap in generational understanding. Now, given the context we live in these days, we do hear a lot about a dis disengagement between families in terms of how their relationships are uh, parents with their children and children with their parents. They feel like there is this misunderstanding circulating there. How would you tell those families to better communicate with each other in these situations specifically, given the various challenges we have coming up with you know, communication gaps? So uh, it is true. Teenagers have a significant spend a significant uh, a significant amount of time on uh, social media, and when they're in manic episodes, especially, they can get very caught up in what's on social media. They can think that the stories are about them, or they can get ideas they really want to uh, to follow up on, and uh, as a result, they may spend all their time in their room on the computer without interacting with the family. And what I would do as a parent, first, I think you have to be, uh, I agree with the my colleague here that you have to be empathic, but you also have to be straightforward in your message and say, I need for you to be joining us for dinner. I need for you to be putting the computer away so that we can uh, uh, do some other things, do homework, get house chores done, take care of the baby, whatever happens to be right. done. Uh, has to be very, uh, the parent has to be very clear on their expectations. Now, they will get pushback from the person who wants to spend more time on the things that are exciting to them. But a conversation needs to happen, again, in an empathic way. This is not good for you. It's not good for you to be on social media all the time. Uh, I think it's triggering you in terms of mood. Maybe it's sending your mood up maybe, or it's sending their mood down. Uh, therefore, you need to be spending certain parts of your day away from the computer. Uh, right. That, uh, again, it, sometimes parents can set up rewards for the person to spend less time at their computer and more time on household tasks, if that's the expectation, uh, or on homework. Uh, but um, I think the first step is to have a conversation about why you're concerned. Right. Uh, David, stay with us. We're going to have to go for a short break, and then we're going to continue uh, this conversation, especially in regards to how lifestyles can impact uh, people who are dealing with the bipolar disorder, how their families can help 
uh, friends can help. Uh, but before that, thank you so much, Dr. Finza Latif, for joining us from Qatar and talking to, this, uh, talking to us a little more about this. We're going to go for a short break. When we return, we're going to talk about this in greater depth. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. We're discussing bipolar disorder and how individuals suffering from it can cope. Joining us for this discussion is David Miklowitz, who is a professor of psychiatry in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the UCLA Semmel Institute. He joins us from Los Angeles. Also joining us is Yasser Ali, who's a mental health counselor, joining us from Lahore. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Yasser, uh, let me continue with you. Now, before we went on for break, we were talking about some of the lifestyle uh, changes that can be brought when a person is diagnosed with the bipolar disorder or what families need to do when they already know that an, an, an individual within the household is suffering, is challenged with this. Now, some of the lifestyle tips that you would recommend, uh, what would they be, especially given the situation we're currently in? It is a, it is a very interesting time that we're in. Um, obviously, we're all physically isolated. isolated. Um, and in that, we're talking about now ways of how we can take care of our mental health and really our, our well-being. So I think staying at home really provides us some of the opportunities that we didn't have when we were uh, uh, busy in our lives uh, uh, going out to work or not being able to stay at one particular spot. So keeping that in mind. You know, there's some there's some really some really interesting things that we can do um, throughout the day uh, in order to help someone uh, or mm -hmm. or even help ourselves um, sort of mitigate some of those um, um, some of those symptoms that somebody with bipolar can um, uh, can experience. Right. So I'm so I'm really thinking um, one of those things could be just exercise, yeah? Working out, just taking care of the body, uh, whatever that means. If that means just moving around in your room uh, for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, taking a brisk walk, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or uh, some doing some regular aerobic exercise, some squats, um, you know, uh, some push-ups. Uh, if you can't do that, then really just sitting down and just breathing, uh, doing some simple mindfulness mm -hmm. exercises right. like deep breathing or uh, yes, sir, it's interesting you bring that up. And I want to take this to David as well, that word mindfulness. Uh, David, that seemed to come up a lot when I was trying to understand uh, bipolar disorder for myself uh, during my research for this show. Can you just explain to us the link between mindfulness, uh, the various therapies that surround it, and how that's being associated to uh, individuals who are suffering with the bipolar disorder? Okay, well, mind, mindfulness has a long history. Of course, we used to have transcendental meditation. We, we now have what are called mindfulness meditation techniques. And what that really means is being able to sit with yourself uh, and observe yourself from a distance to be able to uh, uh, ex experience what's going in, on in your mind without judgment. So experiencing the breathing of your, your breathing, your heartbeat, the various feelings in your body and to be able to just experience them, not run away from them. Likewise with thoughts, when one sits in a chair and just meditates quietly, uh, you may have negative thoughts. And the idea is to, instead of trying to chase them away or talk yourself out of them, to simply observe them as a phenomenon in the same way you might observe your heart beating or your breathing going in and out. And it creates in a person a state of relaxation right. and focus, which allows them to handle stress better. Uh, it's a learned technique. It's not one of those things you can just do uh, once and then hope it's going to be helpful. Usually people need a meditation plan each day, some half an hour of sitting quietly uh, or uh, listening to a meditation tape of which there are many you can download different meditation exercises uh, from your computer. Uh, but what people find is it, it creates a, a certain peace. It allows them to focus, allows them to uh, have a certain structure to their day. And one of the things we know about bipolar disorder in terms of coping is the importance of structure, that people do much better when there's predictability, when they have regular sleep-wake cycles, 
Right. Uh, they get up at the same time, wake up at the same time. And meditation can be an important part of the day. Right. Uh, and we do have evidence that it's effective, at least for depression. We don't know if it's effective for mania, but people who are depressed who meditate regularly, it does seem to speed up their recovery. Right. Uh, David mentioned uh, during uh, the process when he described uh, mindfulness for us, uh, trying to see yourself from afar without judgment. Now, you as a mental health counselor, and when you uh, talk to patients, when you deal with them, when you counsel them, how important is uh, talking about that factor to not be so harsh on yourself, to not judge yourself too much? and to be able to deal with uh, your challenges in a judgmental free zone. Oh, I think it's so important. I mean, that's re if, if you really think about it, that's really where, where it all begins. Uh, you know, when a child's growing up, if they really are exposed to very harsh conditions of persecution, of being very bad, then that can be internalized in, in, in really long lasting ways. Uh, and 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 obviously, uh, a, somebody being bipolar is a, um, you know, we, we can then see, oh, it actually makes sense that uh, somebody would feel all these extreme emotions now because, you know, uh, they might be really judging themselves harshly when they're depressed or really just completely elated at the sight of something good, good happening in their lives. Right. I, I see how... that time... Right. I see how you're, you're talking about during that time, it's essential to uh, feel what you're feeling, but also know that it's okay uh, to be feeling what you're feeling. David, just one last question from you uh, on that point. That whole uh, conversation that we just had about discussing things, about family supporting uh, their loved ones and having those open conversations, how do you feel like when we're seeing such uh, anxious uh, circumstances around us, such anxiety-inducing circumstances around us, that can still happen in an effective manner. It's a challenge, uh, and we're all stuck at home. Uh, the kids can be bored. There can be a lot of irritability expressed towards one another. I think we have to think about it as a time where we don't have as much control mm -hmm. as we usually do. We don't know when this will lift, when it will all go away. Uh, and it's an opportunity for families to sit down and get to know each other, to be able to interact in a positive way. If a, a good way to handle this period, I think, is to structure the day for the family, for there to be certain activities that are done together, certain activities that are done uh, by oneself, uh, there should be uh, mutual contributions to dinners or what's done in the evening. Uh, if there have to be errands run, there should be people who are, uh, are known to do that or can take care of that maybe on different days. For the person with the disorder, they need to be uh, very much part of the family, um, even if it's upsetting to them. If they are having anxiety, it, maybe meditation can be done as a family. Right. Uh, families often sit down together and do a meditation exercise to calm their uh, their person down and helping people structure their sleep. There's uh, sleep and wake cycles, having rules in the house about when the Internet goes off uh, is, a, is a good plan. Uh, but some families, I think, are able to use this time of isolation to really talk to each other and get to know each other as people in ways that they didn't know, weren't able to before when you're, you're so busy with work. Right. Thank you so much, David McLowitz, for joining us, giving us insight into this. Yasser Ali for joining us from Lahore. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again next week with more stories. Till then, stay safe. Goodbye.